from Sean, creator of the video you're watching right now, and co-creator of um, uh, uh, past comes a video essay about a movie about people who go to work. I, I, fall down I knew it. I knew it was gonna. I knew it was gonna fall down. Uh, the video is called Y2K and Office Space. This is immortality. <coughs> I didn't totally know what I'd talk about in my first real video essay, but I knew I wanted it to be about the movie Office Space by director Mike Judge. After about a year of deliberation, I can safely say that it's earned the title of my favorite movie ever made. Not only that, I think it's the best comedy film of all time. That could just say a lot about me and the types of comedy films that I enjoy. Hi, I'm Sean, by the way. But there's something about this movie that's always fascinated me, made me appreciate it for more than just its wit. It was released in February of 1999, and it didn't do well in the box office. It lost a lot of money. This is likely due to bad marketing. Mike Judge hated the original poster, saying it looked like an Office Depot ad. Fox pulled it from theaters when it made $40,000 during the last weekend of the month following release. Just a brutal run. On August 5th, 2001, Comedy Central would broadcast the film on cable TV, drawing 1.4 million viewers in that first airing. By 2003, the channel had aired the film another 35 times. By that same year, it would sell 2.6 million VHS and DVD copies, making it into the top 20 best-selling Fox DVDs of 2003. The fact that it was able to compete with some of these other Fox IPs proves that there was something special about Office Space. It eventually made its budget back due to its home video success, and as a result, it became a cult classic. Its impact during the early 2000s showed in a few interesting ways. A few years after release, an assistant director on the film recalls going to a TGI Fridays, noticing the employees' uniforms lack their trademark buttons, or the flair that Jennifer Aniston's character quits her job over in the film. The manager told him that ever since Office Space had come out, customers made jokes about their waiter's flair, so much so that the entire chain stopped requiring it in their dress code. Upon finding out about this, Mike Judge was surprised, so maybe I made the world a better place. You may not know that in 1999, Swingline didn't sell red staplers. Milton's prop is actually just a black stapler painted red, a simple aesthetic choice that made it pop against the usual gray background, as well as helped him to identify the prop due to the thickness of his glasses. However, Swingline was bombarded by fans who wanted a red stapler of their own. In 2002, the company began producing and selling staplers in the now iconic cherry red color. This is an example of a concept in which life imitates art. That's actually what it's called. Astrophysicist Carl Sagan has explained the benefit of this idea before. In 1961, he wrote an article about Venus, which as far as he knew included the first suggestion about terraforming the planets, that is, to make them a livable environment. The idea was soon taken up by a number of science fiction authors in a continuing dance between science and science fiction, in which science stimulates the fiction and the fiction stimulates a new generation of scientists, a process benefiting both genres. TVTropes.org puts the stapler in a subcategory of life imitates art known as defictionalization, a marketing tactic you've seen before. Defictionalization occurs when a fictional product comes into existence because of the trope that spawned it. Bubba Gump Shrimp Company following the release of Forrest Gump, Nestle's Wonka products, and those gross Harry Potter jelly beans are perfect examples of this. While the stapler wasn't advertised as a movie licensed product, the special edition DVD did include a mail-in rebate to get one, and I was able to capitalize on it. Actually, I was about 16 years late. My point is that not only was the film a cultural success, there was also a give and take between the film itself and its audience that I find really unique. Office Space was able to affect its target audience in a way not many films have been able to do since. It gave people insight, made them quit their jobs to pursue things they were more passionate about, or just to escape the office environment depicted so hellishly in the film. It single-handedly made flair a nuisance in the service industry, effectively rendering it extinct, and created a symbol so tangible and synonymous with this subject material. This stapler is a symbol of the 9-to-5 struggle, emphasizing an unwillingness to stoop to corporate work parties and affirming the keyboard jugglers that make this world such a merry-go-round of identity. That sounded really pretentious. That's good, this is good. I don't want to just talk about Office Space though. This video is about the film's timelessness, so I thought I'd start by talking about Y2K, an event central to the film's premise, as well as some other factors that tie into its theoretical obsoleteness. And then after that I can suck its dick a little bit. Out of college, writer-director Mike Judge held a few jobs in physical and mechanical engineering, later joining a startup video card company in Silicon Valley, but he thought those were all boring. However, these jobs ultimately gave him the inspiration and personal experience to articulate how mentally exhausting a cubicle position can be. In 1996, Judge wrote the treatment for Office Space, which the president of 20th Century Fox, Tom Rothman, thought was the best piece of workplace satire he'd ever read. However, the late 90s were a scary time for anyone who worked with a computer. They were big and ugly as shit, made ungodly noises, and took nothing but floppy disks. Sounds like my mother-in-law.
This obviously isn't a new concept. Any movie that includes modern technology runs the risk of feeling unintentionally anachronistic when viewed in the future. For example, You've Got Mail is a fantastic film, but because online dating has become so intuitive and normalized since it's come out, it's difficult to separate the film from the stigma of 1998's technology. Thoughtfully curated email written on laptops so big they could have used a ceiling fan as a cooling system were important to the film's aesthetic and the dynamic of the character's relationship. The internet's rapid acceleration in the last 20 years hasn't made the film worse by any means, just a little dated. This isn't always the case, as modern trends are really what determine what's passe and what isn't. Films like High Fidelity and Memento narratively utilize technology that may have been considered outdated during the mid-2000s, but could feel more modern when watched today due to the mainstream resurgence of vinyl and Polaroid pictures. Vinyl and Polaroids are also timeless inventions, as they're aided by their lack of technology. They still work the exact same way they did when they were both invented in the 40s, and still produce the exact same aesthetically pleasing result. Nobody's going back to these laptops with the aesthetic. Office Spaces being written in 1996 allowed Judge to include a very topical issue that was decades in the making, one of the greatest technological crises of all time, the year 2000 problem, aka the Millennium Bug, aka Y2K. FYI, the mainframe computers used during the 60s and 70s were revolutionizing the way banks, airlines, and governments were operating on a daily basis. A major downside, however, was the cost it took to store data, ranging anywhere from $10 to $100 per kilobyte. That shit was valuable. To help put that into perspective, a flash drive loaded with just 8 gigabytes of my personal nude photography would be worth hundreds of millions of dollars in 1975. As compared to their value today, which is only $5 every month. With every number and letter taking up valuable disk space, programs used to hold date information with 6 characters, 2 for the day, 2 for the month, and 2 for the year, rather than 8 characters, 2 for the day, 2 for the month, and 4 for the year. Some programs saved even more space by using 5 characters, 2 for the year, and 3 to represent the day within that year. After decades of programming this way, inevitable problems arose as the end of the millennium crept closer. Testing prior to 2000 found that date logic embedded in purchased goods and services would either fail to process or corrupt data as a result of the two-digit abbreviations. Dates that required the rollover of a 99 to a double O were deemed Event Horizons as an homage to the metal band with the same name. Hey guys, this is Ryan and Michael from Event Horizon. First, I'm sure you all know that David recently left the band. Uh, In addition to software malfunctions, some dumb dumb programmers who were too busy sucking on mama's thumb after sticking up the little butt cracks misunderstood a little known rule set by a little known thing called, um, I don't know, the Gregorian calendar. The rule stated that years divisible by exactly 100 are not leap years, leading programmers to believe the year 2000 wouldn't be one. However, an exception to the rule states that years divisible by 400 are leap years, henceforth making 2000 a leap year. <laughs> Duh! Duh! A third pretty inevitable problem was the general confusion of these dates and their lack of specificity. There isn't a lot to indicate what value goes where. I'm sure you've experienced this if you've seen an abbreviated date written by someone from a different country. Everyone does something a little different. In this case, the first 31 years of the century could be mistaken for days and the first 12 mistaken for months. Hypotheses that surrounded what would happen the second the clocks ticked over resulted in nothing short of absolute chaos. To combat these issues, extensive precautions were put in place and hundreds of billions of dollars were spent fixing the past few decades worth of code. The US government passes the Year 2000 Information and Readiness Disclosure Act and forms a President's Council consisting of officials from agencies like FEMA to oversee efforts of private companies tasked with preparing computer systems for the new year. If that sounded boring as fuck, that's exactly why this guy hates his life so bad. Ron Livingston's character, Peter Gibbons, is a programmer for one of these companies, called Inatech. Day after day, he's in charge of painstakingly searching bank code, changing two-digit years into four-digit years, all the while getting his dignity slapped in the ass by the pillar of higher-ups sent from FEMA to make his life a living hell. This job has long become extinct, which to me is interesting. This office is filled to the brim with obsolete technology, yet it doesn't feel like that matters at all. If we think of the film having an expiration date, then Office Space was doomed from the start. Writer Mike Judge gave Peter a job that wasn't meant to be a timeless venture. He was destined to transcend from his turmoil, and in this movie that idea of fate goes a long way. Despite the inexistent job, the relatability remains intact. Mike Judge's writing brilliantly satirizes the mundaneness of a typical office environment, but the delivery of his jokes and the cadence of his very specific characters are just as important, making casting a make or break for a movie like Office Space. This would foreseeably spark disagreements between Judge and the studio. The only cast member Judge had in mind when writing the script was David Herman as Michael Bolton. They had worked together before. Everyone else was unaccounted for. The studio was hoping for a big star to cast as Peter, specifically Matt Damon or Ben Affleck, who were both still riding high from Good Will Hunting success. Judge did not like this idea. He saw his characters as real people. Casting someone with the star power of Damon or Affleck would have given Peter too much swagger, as Judge puts it. I'd been miserable in my office jobs, but never thought I deserved better. 
Judge reluctantly agreed to meet with Matt Damon in New York, thinking that the film was never going to get made. Meanwhile, a virtually unknown Ron Livingston auditioned for the casting director, who immediately sent his tape to New York for Judge to watch. I called Nancy immediately. I could make this movie today with Ron. I met with Matt, he was really nice and liked the script, but I'd found Peter. Gary Cole, who played one of the most memorable characters, Bill Lumberg, surprisingly had not a lot of comedy experience. He'd been in the Brady Bunch movie. Judge's writing was clear enough, however, for him to completely understand the type of character Lumberg is. We all knew a Lumberg, that annoying passive-aggressive authority figure. The likes of Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn auditioned for Peter's neighbor Lawrence, who didn't land the role based on the fact that Diedrich Bader exists. I'm gonna talk about Steven Root a little later. I think that man deserves everything in the universe, including his own section. Jennifer Aniston's role as Joanna was heavily suggested by the studio, who still needed a big actor if Ronnie L was gonna be the lead. This put loads of pressure on Judge, who didn't want to be responsible for ruining her career. Turns out he wasn't, and he didn't. In fact, he put together a kick-ass cast. A kick-ass, if you will. Saving it from whatever the fuck this movie would have been. And no, I'd rather not think about if it would have made money or not. The studio, of course, wasn't done fucking shit up, because this film's marketing was really bad. I'm not surprised it failed. Look at this poster. <laughs> It's a good thing they fixed it for the home video release. Jennifer Aniston probably would have been a great help if she was on the poster, but her role was too small for it to have made any sense. God forbid the poster didn't make any sense! The studio cut together eight trailers for the movie, and the two that Judge thought were the worst, they liked the best. From Mike Judge, creator of Beavis and Butthead, and co-creator of King of the Hill, comes a movie about people who go to work. That sounds fucking... Awesome. The humor of Office Space isn't the kind that really works with jokes cut out and crammed in a three second snippet. Not a single one lands. This is a, a suck. Except that one, I think that one's pretty good. That being said, when the jokes are properly placed within the context of the movie, Office Space is nothing short of fucking hysterical. And then I want to go back to my apartment and watch Kung Fu. Do you ever watch Kung Fu? I love not to mention influential. I was already a huge fan of the movie before I found out the printer scene wasn't a parody of something else. This scene is completely original, I just seen parodies of it. Ted Cruz even did one about Hillary Clinton destroying her personal email server. I fucking hate that I think that's really funny. The scene was almost completely improvised as well, they just went out and started shooting it. The leniency of Judge's direction allowed the cast to improv throughout the whole movie, resulting in some of the most memorable lines of the film. PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean? Not gonna, yeah, not, gonna, not gonna work here anymore anyway. <laughs> the written jokes too. Mm, some of these jokes. I think that the guy might actually be able to help. I mean, he did help Anne lose weight. Peter, she's anorexic. Yeah, I know. The guy's really good. Okay, you know the movie's funny, I'm gonna get back on track. Thinking about Judge's bizarre job choice for Peter, it began to make sense from a writing standpoint. Placing Peter in a job position that might add even the slightest personality trait to his character runs the risk of impeding on Judge's aesthetic in making his workplace the bane of his existence. By giving Peter a job that was intended to be forgotten after 1999, the focus can then shift to Peter as a human being rather than Peter as an employee. The same can be said for Jennifer Aniston's character Joanna, a waitress at Tchotchkes who is required to wear at least 15 pieces of flair to reflect her personality. Her unwillingness to take this mandate seriously disassociates her character from her employment status, allowing her personality to live in its own. That can't be said for someone like Bill Lumberg, whose character is defined solely by his role as the boss. This anti-human trait is crucial to Bill's character, reaffirmed by his signature coffee cup, which, Judge clarifies in the script, he is never seen without. It's even in Peter's dream about Bill having sex with Joanna, and this scene where he throws his plate away only to cut to the mug magically back in his hand. This goes for all the aggravating characters who work at Genetech. This guy, this guy, Peter Griffin, this guy, this- Whoa! Not this guy. Thomas Mikowski is an interesting character. He's given his job at Genetech such an importance that it's almost completely engulfed him, defining who he is. He's horrified of losing his job, and yet can't seem to answer the simplest of questions about it. Why couldn't the customers just take him directly to the, to the software people, huh? Well, uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, because... The only people who show up to his get well party following his failed suicide attempt to turn final destination scene are people he knows from work. Tom's pretty deep in Inatech, but there's still a sliver of hope he hangs onto in the form of his million dollar idea, the jump, jump to conclusions, Matt. 
Able to fund a prototype using his settlement money, Tom is ecstatic about his invention, even though it's the worst idea I've ever heard in my life, Tom. You can't help but adore him for it, and it gives his character so much more depth than someone like Bill. This shred of salvageability is a struggle for Samir and Michael too, who badly want to separate themselves from their work lives, but are hesitant due to their stable pay and ample abilities within the field. That is, until they get fired. Office Space has a unique structure and can pretty much be divided into three different movies, which makes analyzing the script a fascinating task. The first movie is about Peter's miserable experience at Inatech, told with the techniques of a typical office comedy. His sudden enlightenment gives him confidence, a romantic partner, and praise from the company. The film begins to subvert its established structure once Peter tells Michael and Samir they've been fired on page 74. Cock gobblers! Here we see the guys in a rut. Michael and Samir are unemployed, and even though Peter can finally spend time in relaxation, it's a position he can't help but feel guilty about seeing his friends treated so unfairly while leaving them in the dust with his unearned promotions. Peter convinces the two to infect in a tech system with a virus that takes excess interest and transfers it into a bank account of their own. At around the 50 minute mark, the film suddenly becomes a heist film. What prompted this? Where is the inciting incident that kicked this whole thing off? Where is the inciting incident? We have a few different moments to choose from. Page 15 has Tom Smykowski informing the guys that Inatech plans on laying people off and that it's possible they could all lose their jobs. This establishes a big conflict, but doesn't spring the story into action. The guys seem more confused than worried. On page 39, something actually happens. Peter's occupational hypnotherapist dies. While this scene is crucial to Peter's character arc, there really isn't a connection to the heist at all. That brings us back to Michael and Samir's firing, which actually occurs on page 66, when the Bobs let Peter know first. That still seems way too late for an inciting incident, but it's the scene that leads Peter's nonchalance to turn to ambivalence. He's finally given a reason to betray the company, and once he tells his friends, the heist film begins. The climax is clear enough. It's on page 92, when Peter finds out that they've taken way too much money way too fast, ensuring they'll get caught. Michael and Samir scold Peter for convincing them to do such a bad thing, call him a bad friend, and leave. Peter writes a full confession and slides it under the door of Lumberg's office, along with the stolen money. That leads me to the third movie, which actually doesn't happen chronologically, it's scattered throughout. Technically it's just a simple B-plot, but the character it focuses on is so eclectic and disconnected to the rest of the ensemble, cutting his parts together would probably work as a standalone short film. Obviously I'm talking about... Lawrence. No. No, I was talk I'm talking about... I'm talking about Milton. Steven Root is by far the actor that has juked me out the most. His character Fuchs and Barry is the first one that I really acknowledged, and since then I've slowly realized he plays an iconic character in, I'm not exaggerating here, literally every movie. It's no question that Root is a rare actor. Cast as the starring role of his very first movie, Crocodile Dundee 2, in which he plays DEA agent parentheses toilet, and it was all uphill from there. This dude's filmography is off the fucking rails. You got Dean Burbage in Monkey Shines, Bubbles from Nemo, Radio Station Guy in Oh Brother, he played an exterminator on an episode of Home Improvement, Coons with a Z in Robocop 3, Panboy for Buster Scruggs, this fucking thing from Ice Age, No Country, Dodgeball, Masters of Sex, yeah you bet, Rango, Leatherheads, Bombshell, Get Out, Men Who Get Big Bang Theory. He was in Big Bang Theory? And of course, Milton from Office Space. My point is, Steven Root is an actor that started and likely won't stop until he's dead. The dude turns fucking 70 this year, and he still adds so much life and youth into the characters he plays. A film can really feel old when there's a glaring difference in an actor's appearance, especially. I watched Mission Impossible for the first time recently, and I couldn't get over how young Tom Cruise looked. It made the movie feel like a relic. That could have been because I watched it on an actual relic, but that's not my point. I would argue that Root looks older as Milton in 1999 than he does in real life in 2021. Jennifer Aniston hasn't aged in the last 20 years either. As a character, Milton is a lovable, sometimes punchable man who is tired of getting pushed around by all the bills and bobs of the world, but takes it like a punching bag because what the hell else is he gonna do? We'll get to that. I think Milton is the most important character of the film, both the hero and the villain, a pot that is dangerously close to boiling over. Judge makes him out to be the weirdo you'd likely avoid around the office, but his incessant rants and compulsion to complain evidently come from a place of defense. He's treated like shit every day by people with the authority to treat him like shit, so it's hard to blame him for standing up for himself when he's told to turn his radio down. If Peter embodies the part of us that never wants to go to work ever again, Milton is the part that wants to murder our boss in cold blood. Taking Milton's plot into account, I would argue that the inciting incident of the film isn't any of these scenes, it's this one. Um... I'm gonna have to ask you to go ahead and move your desk again, so... Lumberg asks Milton to move his desk for a fifth time now, an issue he openly expresses frustration about earlier in the film. Amongst his many complaints, he includes the office-wide switch from swing line staplers to Boston staplers, making his red swing line a prioritized MacGuffin. So when Lumberg does this, 
Milton solidifies his decision right. too. Shit, the building on fire. Now, you might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with the heist? And my answer is, it doesn't. Do you remember what I said about fate earlier? Because in this movie, fuck- This is what I meant. Hours after Peter slides his confession under Lumberg's door, Milton enters the office to take back his stapler, the free money on the ground, and while he's at it, why not set the building on fire? The story of Peter, Michael, and Samir means nothing at all. The only story that truly matters involves the dynamic between Lumberg and Milton. The lack of narrative importance throughout the entirety of the film is what makes this satirical message so rooted. Jobs like these are so torturous because they're useless. Bill knows it and Peter knows it, but there's a barrier of superiority that blocks them from agreeing with each other. Someone whose thoughts I really admire are Duncan Trussell's. On a podcast, he talks about a book by David Graeber called Bullshit Jobs, which explains Peter's struggle almost exactly. Take a listen. Many humans, they have jobs where they're supposed to work eight hours a day, but the amount of work that they actually have, they could get done in two hours. Mm -hmm. When we go to work, we're selling our time, which means I'm your slave for eight hours, essentially. Yeah. If there's downtime, the, the employer feels like he's getting ripped off. The employer knows that there's not enough work. You both kind of have to lie to each other. Mm. So, so not only are you having to do this play act of pretending to work, but you're also like having to be dishonest. And according to Graeber, this is like one of the most psychologically brutal things that can happen to a human. Peter is so mentally exhausted having to live this double life as an unneeded employee who doesn't do his job. In order to keep this job, he lies to dozens of people every day, even though doing so only allows him to go back the next day so he can lie to them some more. Office space is a satire of the office lifestyle, that much is obvious. But what it's about is our individual freedom and how we choose to perceive our self-worth. Peter recognized his life was so shitty because of where he worked, so he decided to change things up. He began to value himself above his employment, and as a result he became a happier person, despite the mistakes he made along the way. If office space tells us anything, it isn't to steal an inordinate amount of money from your company for revenge, or commit arson out of frustration, but to realize that our jobs don't have to define our lives. I think you can find some solid advice hidden inside Peter's million dollar aspiration. He's made out to sound lazy or motivationally flawed, but committing to it allowed him to transcend his depression, kickstarting the film. Accomplishing things and pursuing different passions and people are what make our lives inherently worth living, but Peter shows us that every once in a while, it can be so healthy to just do nothing. Nothing, huh? I would relax, I would sit on my ass all day, I would do nothing. <laughs> 